why don't we start by introducing, uh, having uh, Tina Backus introduce, uh, introduce you as the Director of Healthcare Reform, but welcome you to introduce yourself. And I believe this is the first you've been with our committee since uh, we started, or my, yes. So let's, let's do again, uh, I realize for members, new members, this is a repeated effort, but it's useful for particularly for our new for witnesses when they come to before our committee for the first time. And uh, some of us are, are, are known to the witnesses, but would, uh, Representative Black, would you introduce yourself and then pass it on the way we've done? It's worked very well, so thank you. Hi, Alyssa Black, I live in Essex and I represent Chittenden 8-3 and I will pass to Representative Peterson. Yes, I'm Art Peterson. I live in the town of Clarendon. I represent Rutland District 2. I'll pass it on to Representative Burroughs. Good morning, I am Elizabeth Burroughs. I live in West Windsor and I represent Windsor One, which is Heartland, West Windsor and Windsor. And I'll pass it to Representative Goldman. Hi, I'm Leslie Goldman. I live in Rockingham and I represent Windsor. You. I think we heard most of that. You went on mute, Leslie, partway through your... Oh, sorry. Uh, I represent Wyndham 3. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, again, welcome, Ina Backus, uh, Director of Healthcare Reform. So I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself and perhaps uh, share some of your own background as well. So glad to have you here. And Ina's going to uh, give us a overview history of healthcare reform in Vermont, which I think helps set some context for much of what we're working on and thinking about. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Ina Backus. I'm the Director of Healthcare Reform in the Agency of Human Services. I've been in this role since uh, June of 2018. The role is prescribed uh, by statute as one that is responsible for coordinating healthcare reform activities across um, state agencies and with the Green Mountain Care Board. And of course, within the Agency of Human Services, which has uh, six departments, um, there is a, a coordination function uh, within the agency as well when it comes to healthcare reform. Prior to my work, in this role, I worked at the Green Mountain Care Board and um, so have familiarity with the Green Mountain Care Board and its uh, regulatory role in the state of Vermont um, with respect to the healthcare system. I grew up in Bristol. I graduated from Mount Abraham Union High School. <laughs> I will go ahead um, and share my screen now if it's okay with everyone. Is everyone able to see? Yes, wonderful, thank you. As, as Chair Lippert described, my presentation is intended to provide some background on healthcare reform, history of healthcare reform um, in Vermont, and then to uh, uh, focus on, um, at, at, at a basic level, an overview of one of the active healthcare reforms that we have ongoing today that you may be familiar with, the Vermont All-Payer Accountable Care Organization Agreement. And so the materials here are, are certainly intended to give an overview, but they do not um, provide deep dive into any particular aspect. And I am happy to do that um, in the future. I'll defer to the chair on, on questions, um, but it is okay with me if you want to interject questions certainly as I as I go along. So as I said, I'm going to I'm going to give an overview and some history about healthcare reform initiatives in Vermont and thinking about healthcare reform and healthcare policy 
and the questions it raises for us in the state of Vermont and in the United States overall, and talk um, a little bit about or somewhat about the all payer accountable care organization model agreement to give an introduction to it um, as it, and of course, as it relates to prior and ongoing healthcare reform activity in our state. And I would just ask members to use the raise hand function if you have questions and uh, I will call on people as, as best I can throughout the presentation. I like to ground any conversation about health policy and health care reform initiatives in, in, some, in some key information about health in the United States as well as in our state of Vermont. We do live in a country that spends more money on health care than any other country in the world, and yet that spending uh, is not necessarily delivering better outcomes and better health status for our populace. Unfortunately, the life expectancy, a key indicator of, of health uh, in the United States, we trail behind other developed nations. And we specifically see our life expectancy impacted um, in particular over recent years um, by deaths due to suicide and drug overdose and, and alcohol related deaths that do have um, a, a health, very much uh, medical healthcare components. In Vermont, we are not, we are not different uh, in entirety, although we are different in some very good ways from the rest of the United States. But in Vermont, healthcare spending uh, is also a considerable con concern for us um, in that healthcare spending on, on Vermont, on behalf of Vermont residents um, was a $6.3 billion in 2018, which is the most recent year that we have data available and our healthcare spending as a share of gross state product um, in that same year was more than 18%. And that is uh, somewhat more than the healthcare spending as a share of the gross domestic product for our nation. I, I, I do think it's important to note that um, Vermont likely is providing for some healthcare spending on, on programs and services that are more uh, generous than, than other states and maybe contributing to some better outcomes that we do see. Um, while we have room for improvement on health outcomes in Vermont, and we certainly have room for improvement in terms of curbing healthcare cost growth, we also uh, consistently rank among the top of states for uh, health healthiest states in the nation. And I also want to celebrate um, that we have had a, a response to our public health emergency um, in the state of Vermont that uh, has, has, I think, reflected some of the investments that we have made in our, our health care and, and public health infrastructure in the state of Vermont. When we talk about healthcare reform, we're talking, as I just described, about a, a large system. It's a complex system that's governed uh, both by state policy as well as federal policy. And uh, our healthcare system in, in the United States is one that is both public and private, which adds complexity uh, to what we discuss. And so there are a number of key questions that I think are really important to frame any discussion about healthcare and healthcare reform initiatives. And those questions really center around what is the problem uh, that you are trying to solve with any initiative. Um, and there are problems regarding healthcare financing that are often um, that are often healthcare reform initiatives. And that means how are we collecting the money that we uh, use to pay for healthcare? How is that money being collected um, and, and, and the financing of healthcare offered through different uh, program designs? Healthcare coverage questions. Uh, do, do citizens have access to healthcare coverage? Are there barriers to healthcare coverage? Um, 
are there policies um, in place uh, that impede healthcare coverage in any number of ways? Uh, there are also problems um, in our healthcare system related to cost, as we just discussed. We have a very expensive uh, healthcare healthcare system, and so healthcare spending growth is 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 a key is a key area for health policy um, to be providing for reform initiatives. And the questions that we can think about in particular to healthcare spending growth are, what's contributing to that growth? Uh, how do we pay for healthcare? How are healthcare providers reimbursed? And how does that payment and reimbursement structure potentially contribute to healthcare spending growth? Another key contributor to healthcare spending growth is simply what is, what is the price or the cost of these healthcare services? And it is the combination of price and utilization that drives overall healthcare spending growth. And finally, there are many, many problems <laughs> to, uh, to confront in our healthcare system. And that also includes how care is delivered how people experience the care available in our healthcare system and the quality of the care that is provided through the healthcare system. And so with those questions in mind, I wanted to walk through um, some key healthcare reform initiatives that Vermont has undertaken um, going back all the way to 1989. This is not by any means an exhaustive list or a comprehensive list of Vermont healthcare reform initiatives. This list is, is meant um, to be illustrative of some different uh, types of healthcare reform problems that we have confronted in the state with different policy initiatives um, and to give some context um, through, through time for um, where we are today in terms of implementing what is called the All-Payer Accountable Care Organization Model Agreement. Uh, and, and that agreement is certainly building on some of these key reforms that we've, um, that we've endeavored uh, over time to in, implement here in the state of Vermont. And in this chart, I also, um, I also uh, paired the reform initiative with um, kind of a, a, a designation of the problem that that particular initiative was trying to confront in the healthcare system. And then the final column that's all the way on the right in this chart, and I know that there's a lot of information here and I am going to talk through it. Um, that column indicates whether the initiative um, was uh, later later undertaken through the Affordable Care Act. Um, the Affordable Care Act is still very much um, a, a turning point in uh, federal health care policy that continues to inform and undergird our, our health care system in Vermont today. And that happened in, in 2010 that the Affordable Care Act was, was passed and we it is, we are still uh, very active in implementation of that. And I, I think it's interesting to point out where um, Vermont was quite, quite a bit ahead of the Affordable Care Act in some of the problems that it was looking to solve um, through health policy. So now I'll walk through the chart. Um, in 1989, Vermont created the Dr. Dinosaur Program, which was a state funded program um, to increase coverage for pregnant women and children. And this program was both um, a, a, a confronting a financing problem, how do you uh, collect money and then provide for coverage for this particular group? And then also a coverage problem um, was, was being addressed with this initiative. It, uh, as I think you can appreciate, um, it, we we all understand that uh, prenatal care and early childhood care is extremely important um, for uh, getting our, our children in our state off to a good start and to uh, ensuring health and well being through the lifespan. And so there's a, a seminal co coverage program um, there in 1989. In 1992, 
uh, the state of Vermont created um, marketplace reforms for persons who are purchasing insurance um, in the private insurance marketplace. Uh, and these reforms included guaranteed issue so that persons could access coverage even if they had had change in circumstance um, or, or other changes and that that coverage be community rated. Um, community rating meaning that the um, coverage, the coverage um, cost, if you will, was consistent uh, regardless, of, regardless of age or particular circumstance. And, and um, that is something that we see later on as reforms that come into play uh, through the Affordable Care Act much later on um, at a national level in 2010. In 1992, also Vermont developed a hospital budget oversight program and certificate of need law, both to regulate spending um, by hospitals in our state, as well as to uh, provide for a process to review uh, whether or not a healthcare facility um, was healthcare facilities coming into the state or looking to uh, open in the state uh, were, were necessary and appropriate in light of the uh, care being offered in the state of Vermont already and the existing um, accessibility of care. I think the certificate of need law is um, a very uh, fascinating process in that it both um, it both it both seeks to ensure that care that's offering being offered in the state is appropriate. And the other side of that coin is, of course, that we want to have um, uh, care be accessible to Vermonters. And there is there are cases certainly uh, very much so where need is demonstrated for additional healthcare facilities and services that they can provide. In 1995, um, and that, uh, excuse me, that's a, that was a spending problem that those, that those reforms were trying to address. Um, how, do we, how do we moderate healthcare spending in the state through budget oversight and regulation of healthcare entities uh, looking to be um, active. In, in 1995, uh, through an 1115 waiver, which is a Medicaid uh, waiver, because Medicaid is a federal and state program, uh, a program that's, that's offered in partnership between the federal government and states. And when states want to customize um, how that program works in a state, it needs to uh, secure a, a waiver. And oftentimes, um, 1115 waivers are a key vehicle for states to customize how the Medicaid program works in their state. And so Vermont, uh, through 1115 and 1995, um, looked to use its 1115 waiver to facilitate healthcare coverage for low income and childless adults, something that the federal Medicaid program did not allow for. But later on, again, in the Affordable Care Act, that that federal program was expanded to allow for the new adult, new adult group to receive uh, coverage. Um, in 2005, also through a Medicaid waiver, uh, Vermont, Vermont enshrined um, coverage for community-based long-term care services and supports as a part of its Medicaid program. And here, um, solving both a, a coverage and a delivery system prob problem or approaching both the coverage and delivery system um, issue meaning that Vermonters who um, qualified uh, to receive um, supports and, and services in their homes rather than only in facilities. And so the Medicaid coverage could be uh, provided for Vermonters to receive these supports that enables them to stay home and to stay independent and to avoid more costly institutional based care um, when, when they need uh, ongoing support. In 2006, uh, the Global Commitment Waiver, which is an 11, it is an 1115 waiver. Um, it's, it's our 
it's a broad and sweeping 1115 waiver that encompasses uh, multiple uh, program waivers into one um, and is still active today in our state. It created the Catamount for Health program um, that the Catamount for Health program no longer exists today, but was created in part uh, with the Global Commitment Waiver, which allowed um, the Catamount uh, Health program to be created um, by and, and to address a problem for individuals purchasing insurance and to help create a program um, of private insurance um, that could be accessible uh, for Vermonters, both um, looking to solve a financing and coverage um, issue. In 2006, uh, the Blueprint for Health patient-centered medical home model was created and also um, facilitated in part by the investments that the state was allowed to make because of our global commitment to health waiver um, that helped the blueprint to get off the ground. The blueprint, again, is a program that supports uh, the patient-centered medical home model. So that means um, it supports a model of high quality primary care uh, for Vermonters. It invests um, with additional, uh, additional payment for those high quality providers. Um, those providers do need to meet national standards for quality of care. And then the Blueprint for Health, in addition, invests in and funds um, in part community health teams that are connected to the primary care practices and provide for additional support uh, and care coordination um, across a continuum of, of healthcare services, allowing primary care providers um, a way to address um, concerns for their, for their patients that may be uh, beyond their immediate sphere of influence in the primary care practice alone. And the community health team model really extends um, into uh, uh, social supports and services um, beyond simply the medical care model. The Blueprint for Health, again, very much active today. And this um, emphasis that it has provided uh, uh, for a statewide model of high quality primary care really positions Vermont uh, to be able to move into um, more, to be able to advance in its healthcare reform approach, particularly if, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll talk more about this as I go through the presentation, particularly if that approach is advancing to one that is really going to emphasize prevention and health promotion, which uh, those, those things rely on a strong primary care system. In 2011, Act 48 was passed in the state of Vermont and created it created a publicly financed universal health care program, which was to be implemented only after the Gem General Assembly enacted further law to finance the program. And as you are familiar, um, the financing plan for that program um, was, was not one that was viable. Uh, given given the cost of a publicly financed healthcare system, and so um, that that portion of Act 48 did not move uh, beyond a point in time where it was determined that the financing for the program was not feasible. However, Act 48 also created the Green Mountain Care Board, which is a regular regulatory entity, and you'll hear from them. I think you maybe already did this morning. So. I apologize for repetition. Um, they have a broad uh, number of regulatory authorities um, that that are uh, important for reducing the rate of growth in healthcare expenditures and improving quality. And those authorities uh, that the Green Mountain Care Board have do include um, and did include testing payment reform models uh, that would influence and reduce the rate of growth in healthcare costs. And those 
um, there was a, a emphasis on those models being all payer, meaning uh, all major payer categories. And again, in the United States, we have a we do have a complicated healthcare system in that we have a fully federal program, which is our Medicare program that offers coverage for, for individuals who are older than the age of 65. We have a state federal partnership, which is the Medicaid program offering historically what has been coverage for low income individuals. And then we have commercial healthcare insurance coverage, which is offered by employers um, in, in, in our state and in the United States. And it can also be purchased by individuals uh, directly. And that is where um, it, it, historically in Vermont, we have made um, policy changes such as Catamount Health to make accessible coverage for individuals. Um, and then, and, in with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the Affordable Care Act also created the healthcare marketplaces. Um, and in 2011, Vermont created the Health Benefit Exchange to align with the Affordable Care Act uh, to create a marketplace for the insurance, for the purchase of insurance for individuals and small groups. It's a regulated marketplace that complies with the, the federal uh, program uh, consumers can shop for and compare uh, health care plans. Those health care plans that are offered on the marketplace um, are comparable in design and are all, um, all, all built on a essential health benefit or benchmark plan. So they have consistent offerings across the plan types. And through um, the Affordable Care Act, considerable federal subsidies for the purchase of health insurance in the regulated marketplaces became available uh, to Vermonters. Um, and that, and so that obviated the need for the, for the Catamount Health Pro Program and we transitioned to operating the Vermont Health Benefit Exchange as the health insurance marketplace. Um, and those Again, so those subsidies um, coming to the state of Vermont uh, were more than uh, what the state on its own had been able to make available um, for the purchase of private insurance. In 2013, the hub and spoke model uh, was created in partnership between the Blueprint for Health supporting spoke practices. Um, those are, are practices uh, largely but not exclusively primary care providers that are able to offer medication assisted treatment to um, persons who are managing um, in their recovery from opioid use disorder. And those folks work with um, hubs that are um, uh, designated methadone um, distribution uh, and treatment um, uh, facilities in the state of Vermont. So building on the building on the infrastructure of the blueprint for health, um, which has the availability of the community health teams uh, and a network of support uh, for providers who are offering medication assisted treatment um, in their practice. And that's, that is a delivery system um, problem that this initiative in particular was looking to address in, in that there, um, there was not a clear, there was not a, a system of treatment uh, readily available um, uh, to persons who were, who were seeking recovery from opioid use disorder. So how, how and so it approached, how can the healthcare delivery system change in design to meet the need of persons who are managing recovery from opioid use disorder. I'm just gonna um, try to move the bar here so I can read the next, <laughs> so I can read the next um, initiatives. 2016, uh, Act 113 was, was uh, provided for by the legislature and this legislation uh, allowed the Green Mountain Care Board and the Agency of Administration to enter into an agreement with CMS 
um, to implement an all payer model. I noted that the Green Mountain Care Board was um, in, uh, created by Act 48 and did need to focus on cost containment um, as a part of the healthcare reform, the sweeping healthcare reform um, that Act 48 that Act 48 put into motion. Those cost contain that cost containment work was um, was emphasized as being uh, necessary to focus on all payers so that as much alignment and consistency as possible uh, could be um, put into play for the healthcare provider system that would be potentially receiving payment differently and changing delivery system. And to do that most successfully, um, having those incentives aligned across the payer types as much as possible is very important so that, and, and while this is, it, it, it still remains the case today. There are different rules uh, from different coverage um, offerings that the healthcare providers need to adapt to, and they need to be able to maintain a fairly complex um, business model to be responsive to the different payer types that we have in our system. The focus of all payer reforms is to try acknowledging that we have multiple payers in the system and multiple payer types to try to align rules, requirements, um, and incentives as much as possible across those different payer types. And with that to um, uh, reduce administrative burden, of course, uh, is, is a, a purpose in that alignment, but also again, to um, strengthen any incentive from a payment change um, or, or delivery system model. Uh, so the, the ACO, uh, the all payer ACO model agreement, again, emphasizing all payers, but also emphasizing that accountable care organizations where providers are working together uh, in a network to share accountability um, for the quality and outcomes and the cost of a group of patients, that those accountable care organizations in the state of Vermont uh, would be the entities um, for, for a focus on a change in payment uh, and also would be regulated by the Green Mountain Care Board, would have standards that those accountable care organizations would need to meet in order to uh, work in the state of Vermont, as well as um, be subject to a budget review uh, by the Green Mountain Care Board. And you probably heard some of this from them today already, or you will hear more. Um, and, and this act also required that the Agency of Human Services establish a process for integrating Medicaid providers and services into payment and delivery system reform. And this is a, a large body of work that the Department of Vermont Health Access um, has undertaken and can also do a deep dive with you on if you're interested in learning more about that. And finally, in 2019, um, I wanted to highlight that Act 63 established um, protections for Vermont consumers that are consistent with those protections, um, many protections afforded by the by the Affordable Care Act, um, and 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 those those protections are preserved um, here in the state of Vermont due to this legislation, um, so that if the Affordable Care Act were to uh, were to be significantly changed, certain key provisions associated with healthcare coverage would remain, um, such as being able to remain on your parents' insurance if you're up to 26 years of age. I will, I will take a, a breath there, or, or I can continue on. Well, let me say that I, I appreciate your, your outline of these uh, reform efforts and the uh, effort, uh, the aligning it with what were the problems being solved and how things prior to the Affordable Care Act uh, were already being put in place uh, in Vermont. Uh, and it's notable that, uh, that at the 2010, it's, it's hard to remember that it was 2010 when the Affordable Care Act uh, was first put in place. Um, 
I, I should, I, I, I'm pulled to, I'm just going to make one further comment. A uh, number of people have said to me, I've asked about what the work of this committee has been. And uh, the Act 113 and Act 63 uh, certainly have been the recent work of this committee, uh, at least during the tenure of some of us who are continuing on the committee. And I've, you know, I've, I've said, and I've been quoted as saying that uh, it's, uh, this committee worked very hard to defend, to protect Vermonters from what were active, in my view, they weren't, I think it's fair to characterize them, attempts to get rid of the Affordable Care Act through either repeal of the act or through the courts and Act 63, as you've outlined in 2019, was a uh, very uh, deliberate and determined effort on the part of the Vermont legislature and then with the governor's support and with the administration's support to move into Vermont law, as you said, a number of the provisions of the Affordable Care Act in the event that uh, during that period when it was actively being um, sought to be overturned at the federal level. So, uh, but they continue to be, I think, important in Vermont law. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of information here, and some of it's historical, but but a great deal of uh, what is outlined here uh, is very useful in understanding how we've gotten from where we have been uh, to where we are currently and what currently exists. Now I'll take a little bit of a deeper dive into Act 48, as it was the legislation that um, put some of the uh, key, the key components of our system that we have today into place uh, and also prompted um, through that legislation, uh, certain approaches to uh, healthcare, whoops, healthcare reform and healthcare policy. Um, as I said, the Act 48 created the Green Mountain Care Board uh, and provided for it um, some, key, some key pieces of work including cost containment, as I said, all payer payment reform, um, also um, oversight of um, workforce development and many aspects of, of health policy um, were, were provided for in Act 48 um, in terms of the Green Mountain Care Board. And, and as I also detailed, um, Act 48 uh, created the Vermont Health Benefit Exchange, uh, which then today, um, provides for the state to meet with the requirements of the Affordable Care Act and um, so that we can uh, take advantage of the federal subsidies um, for Vermonters in uh, individuals that are purchasing health care coverage. And finally, uh, as I said, uh, Act 48 did um, create the detailed planning process for um, Green Mountain Care and, um, and provided for the steps that needed to be uh, achieved um, in order for that to be um, implemented. And as I described, it was with the financing plan for Green Mountain Care um, that it was determined it was not feasible to continue moving forward with um, what was known as a single payer, um, but I think the act actually described it as a universal and unified uh, healthcare payment system. I, I also wanted to um, just uh, mention that in 2013, uh, we received, the state of Vermont received a state innovation model grant. That's to, that, that model grant was available to the state of Vermont through the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. That's the same entity that we now have our all payer accountable care organization agreement with. And it was created by the Affordable Care Act um, very specifically to promote uh, new payment models, uh, to promote multi-payer payment models um, and to allow Medicare, um, they often uh, call, you know, their special, the special sauce of the, of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation is that it can bring Medicare to the table as an innovative payer 
in a way that wasn't possible prior to the ACA. Uh, and so um, the Innovation Center provided states with grants for testing innovative payment and delivery system reform models. Vermont was a recipient of the first, um, of the first wave of grants and received $45 million over three years, beginning in 2013. Um, those, those dollars were used in a, in a whole host of ways, as you might imagine, but included um, investments in uh, planning, stakeholder engagement, um, uh, contractual expertise, and significant analysis to determine um, uh, to determine uh, the best course in terms of an approach to healthcare cost growth containment through payment and delivery system change. So, so it's definitely informative um, for some some key policy um, some key policy uh, uh, models that that we are still implementing today. This, this slide here is actually a slide that was created in 2013 um, and is still incredibly relevant and descriptive of what we are endeavoring to do in the state of Vermont in terms of healthcare reform to impact both cost growth um, in our state as well as quality, quality of care. Going back to that slide that I talked about at the very, what problem are we trying to solve? Um, we are very active in our, in our current policy in trying to solve um, and address the growth of healthcare costs, as well as the quality um, and patient experience of care in, in Vermont. So I want to uh, emphasize that again, that um, our current this current healthcare reform initiative that is called the All Payer Accountable Care Organization model is a cost containment and delivery system redesign effort. It's not a coverage model. It's not an insurance product. Um, it is not. It is not a healthcare coverage vehicle. And so it is not trying to solve that problem of who is accessing healthcare coverage uh, specifically in our state. And again, this slide from 2013 really emphasizes, um, emphasizes a path uh, that, that was um, set out on and that we are still working on today to move our system away from fee-for-service reimbursement, which I'll talk about a little bit more in just, in just the next slide. Um, to build on the uh, strong infrastructure that was put in place by the statewide Blueprint for Health primary care medical home model supported by community health teams, emphasizing primary prevention um, and health promotion. And that this model include all payers, again, uh, for to, to have the strongest possible incentive for change because the incentives um, are aligned across all payers. All payers are saying, these are our priorities. There aren't competing priorities among payers. We have, we have more work to do on that front. Um, we certainly, and we have identified where we can improve on that front, um, but we are but we are working with all payers um, at the table, all major payer types. And finally, that any, um, any move away from fee-for-service and delivery system redesign should absolutely incorporate performance measures for cost, quality, and patient experience of care, which our model um, today uh, does in fact do. So in terms of ad addressing healthcare spending growth and the, the, uh, the, the moderating healthcare cost growth in our state, um, we need to change how we pay for and deliver care. Healthcare in the United States and in Vermont has predominantly been paid for through a fee-for-service reimbursement model. That means that 
every service that is uh, deemed to be a covered service. Um, so it is typically a healthcare service that is performed, such as a test, an image, an exam, an assessment. Uh, those types of services are reimbursed and paid for uh, regardless of the quantity of those services delivered, regardless of the outcomes um, from those services, regardless of whether or not that is the most appropriate service um, for a person's need. Uh, other, other healthcare services um, that may not have been or may not historically be considered healthcare services, such as time spent coordinating care, uh, making phone calls, um, follow-up uh, follow between providers, uh, providers seeking consultation from one another, um, providers communicating to the care team. Those sorts of activities that very much influence health and outcomes are not typically reimbursed by the fee-for-service system, or if they are reimbursed, they're not reimbursed in a way um, that emphasizes that sort of care coordination activity over um, a more uh, high, high yield service, such as an image or um, such, as a, such as an image or visit. Um, and because of this model of reimbursement, which again is the predominant model for our healthcare system, um, we we see that uh, healthcare outcomes are, are not necessarily um, as good as they should be. Um, we see a system that uh, where there is um, a lot of utilization of healthcare services um, without necessarily that utilization being clearly linked uh, to the best possible outcomes. So the the theory is that providing a budget for the healthcare system, um, paying the healthcare system prospectively um, based on what is it, uh, expected to be a reasonable, a reasonable cost to deliver services, allows the system to operate with more flexibility, allows the system to invest in services and supports that may, like I said, not otherwise be uh, reimbursed and provides predictability for the system um, and uh, pre predictability for, for the system. Within the budget, if the system manages more efficiently while still delivering high quality healthcare outcomes, then the system can keep, can keep those savings, so to speak. So there is an incentive um, to perform in the most efficient possible way to provide the best possible health outcomes uh, rather than uh, simply being reimbursed for each additional service regardless of the health outcome. And that is really the premise of the payment model that we are implementing through the all payer accountable care organization model agreement which is an agreement between the state of Vermont and the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation that I talked about just a few minutes ago. And this is the logic model that describes um, what, I just, what, I, what I just reviewed with you, that we will test um, paying for healthcare differently, that that diff change in payment will allow for transformation in care delivery because of the flexibility to invest in care coordination and social determinants of health. And then um, from there, we, uh, we emphasize the importance of seeing improved population health outcomes and focusing on improving access to primary care, reducing deaths due to suicide and drug overdose, and reducing the prevalence and morbidity of chronic disease in, in our state. Which should, should I pause or should I keep on going? Okay. I think it might be good to pause and uh, see if there are particular questions and you we've <laughs> had you going nonstop now for uh, 
a good hour uh, or not quite an hour, but um, let's see if there are particular questions. And I see there's at least one from Representative Cordes and then, uh, and then the, we'll, we'll come back and finish up and know that we're going to be coming back to the all payer model uh, issues uh, in significantly more um, depth uh, tomorrow. So Representative Cordes, you have a question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Ina. It's good to see you and hear from you again. Um, I have a comment and then um, one, possibly two questions. Uh, about Act 48, I just wanted to highlight that um, I know you were talking specifically about technical policy um, within Act 48, but I wanted to mention as well that we are still striving um, to uh, manifest or make real the the human rights principles that were also embedded in, in Act 48 of universality, equity, participation, transparency, and accountability. Um, so just wanted to put a, a plug in there for those five human rights principles, which um, I think we're a really important part of Act 48. Um, and as far as the all payer model, um, you know, what would you say is are some of the biggest obstacles um, in that program, including um, is one of them getting providers um, to participate? How are we doing with that? In November, um, and I'll and I will I will touch on this, but I'm happy to 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 talk about it now as well. But in November of 2020, uh, the Agency of Human Services, um, given that we are in now performance year four, we're beginning performance year four of a five year performance period in the all payer model agreement. Uh, we we put forth. Um, what's called implementation improvement plan or reboot. It's also been described as a reboot for our model agreement because at this time we can see where there are areas uh, for improvement in our performance. Um, we do know that uh, more payer participation is necessary um, to, to test the theory of the case, if you will, that if we align incentives across as many payers, as, as is feasible, that the um, providers who are uh, transforming care delivery um, and, and are working under this changed payment model will um, both have, a, have, a, have an easier time doing that because there are consistent, um, there's a consistent emphasis across the payers that are covering Vermonters. Um, uh, but also that the incentive and, and the need to change the business model from one that drives um, utilization. And I mean that for the system, I don't mean any one provider, but I mean that the system drives utilization in this way, um, that we know that there's more work to do um, to really test that. And so we put forth uh, recommendations, which I think I would like, if you're interested to come back and do a deep dive into those recommendations, even tomorrow, if, yeah, if that's tomorrow. appropriate, um, and, and really uh, highlight uh, where we think um, we need to make some improvement in order to perform better in this agreement. One, one thing to highlight is that the state employees um, were not attributed to this model um, as, as a group. Um, the state employees are self-funded um, with Blue Cross Blue Shield as the administrator of the state employee uh, health plan. Um, but the state employees will be and are being attributed now uh, for 2021. And uh, so that's just one example of a large group of commercially insured that were not participating uh, in the model and now will be participating in the model. And it's improvements like that, uh, that we need uh, to continue working, working towards. Thank you, Ina. And I have another question that I can save for tomorrow because I think it might relate to 
your presentation tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that let's, let's, um, if we can, uh, try to save all payer model in depth questions for tomorrow. We've asked, I've asked the, uh, I've asked for us to be given an update on the reboot, uh, at, as part of it, uh, the presentation tomorrow. So we'll, we'll hear more about that, uh, then as well. Uh, I'm going to just, I, I see Representative Goldman has a question. I, I want to just pick up on something that you just touched on, uh, you know, and I was thinking about earlier, and that is uh, who can we in fact affect in our healthcare reform efforts uh, in Vermont? And both as the Green Mountain Care Board was presenting earlier this morning, I, I found myself wanting to ask and to, to say that um, there are certain, it, it gets complicated or it seems complex as in terms of uh, self-funded plans uh, being uh, in or not available it being outside of the uh, purview of the state of Vermont's, uh, a lot of our legislative efforts. And uh, could you talk a little bit about that and how that relates to healthcare reform, who, who we're able to influence and where, we're, where we have limitations because of the, uh, what's called ERISA plans, or I don't know if that's technically right, but the self-funded uh, yeah. employer plans. Yeah, those those self funded plans are governed by uh, by federal by federal law, and that federal law basically says that those those plans um, uh, because they could cross state lines and be offered in multiple states are not subject to um, state state regulation because that would be too burdensome to be subject to multiple states uh, regulation. Um, I believe is the is the premise of that of that federal law, and so those plans are not subject to um, the the state regulation of insurance um, in the same way that the insurance um, the the fully insured um, are are subject, and so that would be um, large group plans in Vermont that are fully insured. Uh, are subject to regulation as well as those plans that are offered on the exchange where someone is, you're, you're, you're purchasing full insurance um, from, from a plan on the exchange. Um, you are not paying your own insurance claims. So you're, you're purchasing an insurance product. Um, those are subject to state insurance regulation. And so there is different purview over those types of insurance offerings than those offerings um, where a large group such as the state employees um, in Vermont the state and in many other places, but the state employees paid their own claims. They are their own insurer um, rather than purchasing insurance from uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, for instance. It becomes important for us over time to understand uh, what those limitations are and are not. Um, Representative Goldman, you have a question still? No, Representative Cordes asked my question. Thank you. Okay. Representative Black. Um, regarding Blueprint, is Blueprint for Health still working? And I mean, it seems as though Blueprint is sort of overlapping a little bit now with um, the AC or the um, ACO or are, are they working in collaboration with each other? Good question, yeah. That's a, that is a great question. Um, the, the blueprint for health and the, and the um, care coordination model with um, the, with the accountable care organization and um, they, they are working in alignment. Um, and, and so the patient centered medical home model is, is still supported through the Blueprint for Health program. Likewise, the community health team supported through the Blueprint for Health program, but they are working in close coordination and alignment with the a accountable care organization, One Care Vermont and its care coordination um, program and resources, which provides for uh, risk stratification of their members so that they can identify um, where 
those members' needs with respect to care coordination and services, um, and also um, where One Care uh, Vermont, and I'm sure that um, you might appreciate the opportunity for them to talk more about what, what they offer, but it, um, it, is, it is an alignment with the blueprint for health. It's important that we keep alignment as, as a central principle of the reform initiative, and that as we continue to move forward and perhaps expand um, in care coordination services, that we remain aligned um, with One Care Vermont in those in those efforts. Um, but there has been really good collaborative work done uh, to align. Uh, just to clarify something you just said, did you say that Blueprint is actually who calculates the risk of of no. you know and attributed people? No, no. One Care One Care Vermont. Um, okay. Yes. Um, okay. Sorry, I thought I misheard. I thought I heard you say that. And you know, can I pick up on that and just? Um, Am I correct in understanding that the Blueprint for Health was uh, in part funded under an earlier 1115 waiver and was not going to be able to be continued, uh, but was able to be continued as a part of the all payer model? Is that, do I misunderstand that or help me under, help us clarify that? I, I, I can help clarify that. And um, in, in a later slide, I'll I touch on it, but I think I can expand on it even more so now. The Blueprint for Health is a multi-payer um, program. And so another reason why it's a really important foundation for um, moving more aggressively away from fee-for-service, the Blueprint for Health program um, has participation um, from commercial payers in the state of Vermont, as well as Vermont's Medicaid program. And previously, Medicare, um, they ran what was called um, uh, Medicare Advanced um, Primary Care, Primary Care Program, Primary Care Practice uh, Initiative. And that was what that predated the Affordable Care Act and what was called a Medicare demonstration project. Um, and so it was through that Medicare demonstration project that the blueprint really became an all payer uh, program. And that Medicare demonstration project, however, was going to be discontinued um, at the end of 2016. And so when we negotiated with our federal partners in the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, they agreed that a strong primary care system, that a system that was supported with community health team uh, and care coordination supports was very important for a statewide healthcare system that was shifting towards risk for healthcare providers, meaning paying providers up front uh, with a set budget for care, it's the most basic kind of explanation of um, where we want to go with the all payer model agreement and where we are in, in our Medicaid program now. Um, if you pay providers up front a fixed amount, then they are at risk for how they perform within that fixed amount. And the providers um, and the care delivery system ultimately needs to uh, perform and be designed to provide for the most efficient care in the most efficient settings uh, to, to, to ensure the best quality outcomes for Vermonters. So our partners in the federal government said it is worth Medicare investing in that foundation um, and we will continue to we will continue to provide that investment. The way that we're going to provide it is through the accountable care organization. Um, and so that's how um, what we consider to be Medicare money flows into Vermont because of this agreement. And it is um, it is on the order of eight million dollars a year uh, that 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 we receive that funding um, for 
what we consider to be the Medicare portion of the of the Blueprint for Health program. Okay. So I'm looking at our time, uh, and I I'm not quite sure, you know, what further you were going to present about the all-payer accountable care organization model agreement. Uh, I, would you like to walk through the rest of what your presentation is today uh, briefly? Sure. And, uh, and then we can, we'll be coming back to hearing from you again tomorrow. And yeah. we, we can recap some things then. And how about what I'll do is I'll just, I think I'll move a, I'll move ahead to this slide here because I think it builds on what I was just talking about um, and, and, and helps to um, kind of lead off to the areas for improvement. Um, but basically in Vermont, we with federal partnership um, have designed a model to pay differently for healthcare. And we do that by paying an accountable care organization differently. Um, it is the accountable care organization only uh, that can receive an alternative payment through the Medicare program. And Medicare is participating in this model by paying providers, um, what's it called, uh, all-inclusive population-based payments. So they're paying providers at the beginning of, of every month. They're still reconciling that to fee-for-service. So we have work to do to further evolve the Medicare payment model. Um, but Medicare is participating in Vermont and it is indeed paying providers differently in Vermont than it pays anywhere else around uh, the entire country. So it is significant uh, that Medicare pays Vermont providers differently than traditional fee for service. Um, so we have Medicare, Medicaid and commercial partners that are all participating in paying an accountable care organization differently in Vermont, we have a statewide accountable care organization, which you will hear from, and they have a broad network and diverse network of provider participants, which does distinguish it from other ACOs, at least those um, that I've seen nationally, which tend to be more hospital-based or primary care-based or hospital and physician-based. But our um, in Vermont, uh, the ACO network is more diverse and includes designated um, agencies. It includes home health agencies, as an example. Um, and so our agreement um, is looking to change how we pay for and deliver care. And it also does some other important things um, for healthcare in the state. Um, again, I'll emphasize that this is an, an agreement that is um, seeking to improve health outcomes and to, and to moderate health, health cost growth, but it is not a healthcare coverage plan. Through this agreement, again, Medicare offers some things through an ACO that they otherwise wouldn't offer. And so that really distinguishes um, Vermont and, and we have this uh, federal partner that's offering um, in Vermont through an ACO um, these these benefits that Medicare beneficiaries otherwise wouldn't um, have access to, including uh, even if they are not considered homebound, getting a, di a post um, hospital discharge home visit, uh, easier access to skilled nursing care. What this really means is that if you need skilled nursing care and that's the most appropriate care, then um, Medicare will pay for that uh, direct directly rather than requiring that you uh, go through a hospital uh, uh, encounter in order to be able to consider eligible for, for skilled nursing care. And finally, telemedicine services. Um, Medicare has been paying for telemedic telemedicine services in rural areas. And I think this is an, a, a, a a true testament to how quickly things change. We all appreciate telemedicine as a much uh, different and essential service, service when we are in a remote environment. And that is a, a key way to maintain, um, to maintain a certain level of healthcare. Um, however, uh, it, as you 
you might not expect because Vermont is largely a rural state, uh, telemedicine services were not available to Medicare beneficiaries in uh, the metropolitan regions of Vermont. And I know it's hard to believe that we have a metropolitan region, but in Chittenden County, for instance, Medicare would not reimburse for telemedicine services, but it does do so through the accountable care organization model agreement. So I, I think it's important to highlight where we have um, where we have uh, access uh, to services different and and because of this of this state federal agreement that we have. Um, and as I've described, the agreement we think encourages better coordination of care, can lead to more meaningful time spent with your provider because there is the flexibility within a different payment model to take that time and to really look at um, look at what the needs are of the patient panel, um, even if those needs were not historically ones that would be covered through a, a fee-for-service model. Linking healthcare outcomes um, for the population with the healthcare delivery system. We want to reduce deaths due to suicide and drug overdose. We know that that is not um, exclusively in the hands of the healthcare system but the healthcare system is a partner in that work very much. And this agreement does, it does uh, formalize that partnership because it holds accountable um, the state of Vermont as well as the healthcare participants in, in, in our state uh, for those outcomes. Um, the, like I, I described, the agreement provides funding uh, for blueprint and support and services at home through the ACO that otherwise would not be available to the state, um, more than $8 million each year. And um, uh, finally, we are moving away from fee for service in Vermont through this agreement on our own terms, or at least on more of our own terms. Um, the federal government is very much moving away from fee for service. It is doing incremental, it's doing so incrementally. Um, Vermont is certainly uh, leading in this regard. Um, however, we have seen now two administrations, the two previous administrations, um, beginning with the Obama administration and uh, sustained through the Trump administration and even uh, enhanced um, in the Trump administration, a real focus on the federal government's part on moving away from fee for service um, for really uh, many of the same, you know, many, many, many of the same reasons um, that we're focusing on it here in Vermont, which is that um, we need to we need to address healthcare cost growth and moderate it so that we have a sustainable system, and we need to we need to look at ways to improve the health outcomes of our population. And so finally, this agreement was signed in 2016, performance year zero of the agreement was 2017, and performance year one was 2018. We're now beginning the fourth performance year out of five, and we can see clearly that there are areas where we need to do work um, make adjustments, uh, modifications to best understand whether um, this new payment model and um, and uh, our work is is um, effective in in improving outcomes and um, in moderating cost growth. And so we've identified four key areas where we think um, we need to. Uh, do more work, which include um, in our state and federal partnership, like I mentioned, Medicare isn't uh, as far along in paying differently for healthcare services as our Medicaid program is, and we would like to see them move even further along. Um, reorganizing and prioritizing healthcare reform activities in the Agency of Human Services, the Blueprint for Health, this uh, our strong foundation for primary care is now sitting uh, with health care reform, uh, health reform in the secretary's office. Um, and we uh, have a reporting structure um, so that we can be sure to align um, 
the activities of healthcare reform, uh, certainly with the blueprint, evolving the regulatory framework uh, for value-based payments. The Green Mountain Care Board um, is, the, is the healthcare system regulator, largely speaking. The DFR does have a component of uh, insurance regulation, but um, that regulatory model really was built on a fee-for-service reimbursement system. And so it does need to evolve uh, in to, to appropriately regulate in a value-based payment system, which is you know, the fee-for-service alternative system, and strengthening the ACO's leadership strategy uh, so that the ACO, um, we have just one ACO in the state of Vermont. This model does not require a single ACO. Um, the model is agnostic to the number of ACOs in the state. We do have one ACO in the state. And so um, that, that leadership and the strategy of the, the ACO really needs to be as strong as it possibly can be to appreciate uh, the different dynamics um, and provide for the, for the most attractive, um, the most attractive model to, to uh, garner participation from both payers and providers in our healthcare system. And so we can talk more about all of these areas tomorrow. Right. Wow, we've covered a lot of a lot of territory here this morning. Uh, but I think it's again, it's in, in the interest of putting together some of the essential building blocks and understanding the current healthcare landscape in Vermont, uh, where we've been, um, what were what were some of the issues we're wrestling with now, and and frankly positioning us to be able to think. Uh, more fully as we have a new administration in Washington as well, which will be undoubtedly advancing some additional healthcare uh, reform initiatives uh, in various areas. Um, I'm going to thank you, Ina, for taking the time with us uh, and spending, spending this time and again in anticipation of more time tomorrow. Uh, I realize there's, I mean, for myself, there's numbers of questions and, and I can imagine for people who are newer to the committee uh, and others who are returning, uh, there's other questions as well. So we'll, we'll turn more to that tomorrow. Um, and I think with that, again, thank you, Ina. Thank you, members. And I'm going to suggest at this point that we uh, adjourn for the morning. And we, a reminder to committee members, uh, we're on the floor at 1.15 today. Uh, so please plan to join uh, the speaker at 115 on the floor, where I believe our uh, uh, agenda is the Budget Adjustment Act. So with that, uh, and we'll, we're back here tomorrow as a committee at, uh, I believe, 9 a.m. Am I correct, Colleen, in, the, in remembering that we're, we convene again at 9 a.m.?